Hi folks, welcome to another session of 52 Weeks of Python. My name is Chuck Black. I'm hopefully helping you to learn to become a programmer by demonstrating uh, software that I've written for teaching purposes, little short snippets of code to teach various aspects of software development, and by showing you how I implemented a very simple project that I called Quaka that actually performs some network management tasks in hopefully an interesting way and demonstrating things that perhaps you're a little bit familiar with. This is a listing of looking at one of my systems. I actually have three laptops that are running Quaka at the moment. I'm pointing at them in these various windows that you can see. So the web-based user interface is accessing the server that's running the Quaka in all the different examples. You can see I'm uh, looking at the same exact information or the same service in all of these, HTTP BBC is what I'm looking at, and yet the data looks different. That's because I have three different servers that are doing the monitoring at different times. Now, of course, you'll only be using one of those, but I'm just pointing this out in order to demonstrate a little bit about the architecture of the way that we do things. You see the user interface is running in the browser here, and yet the services are running on a different computer. Now, don't let that dissuade you from uh, learning how this works. It's actually pretty easy. As I mentioned last time, the amount of code that is required to be written by you is very small and straightforward. Furthermore, creating these things, there are automatic scripts. Uh, there are scripts that will automatically generate an application for you so that you don't really have to do too much, as well as many tutorials. So, uh, don't let this daunt you. You're just learning, and as much as you pick up, we'll all be good in the long run. So let's get started. Oh, I wanted to show you one more thing, if I can find the right one of these that I thought was a little bit interesting. Yeah, and this laptop that I have here, if you look, I know this is kind of small for you to see, but this date point is Monday. This date is Tuesday, that date is Wednesday, this date is Thursday, today is Thursday that I'm recording this. Now I have a bunch of days listed here and yet I'm trying to give you an hourly summary. Why does it look like that? Well, the reason is because during this time, I actually had my service not running. So I was doing other things on this particular laptop or I just had it shut down for a while. And so like here, it's very obvious that there are time spans where nothing really is going on here and I don't have any data. Anyway, just thought that was interesting. Let me make the screen big so that it's easier for you to see the data that I'm going to be presenting. Okay, so let's get started with the teaching part of today's session. Now, if you recall the last session that we had, we talked about a single device and we created a device here. This is a variable that uh, is called device. And we created something. I'll give you a second to remind yourself if you see the curly brackets and you see name value pairs separated by a colon, then that is an indication that this is what type of data structure. Uh, that's correct. Correct. This is a dictionary, a key of name, and this is the value of name, vendor, Cisco, et cetera, et cetera. And then we printed some of that out. Now, in most of your experience, probably in all of your experience, there won't be one device, there will be many devices. So what we're going to do in this particular lesson is we're going to show you how to deal a little bit with multiple devices. Now before we get into that, let me spend a minute going over these things right here. These are called import statements and I know I referenced them quickly last time that we talked, at least I believe I did, but I want to go into a little bit more detail about them here. Now you see a number that follow this pattern from some module name import and then typically it's going to be a function name or a piece of data or something. Hi folks, Chuck here interrupting myself and your viewing of this video going through L02 devices. I think this is week four. Uh, it's been pointed out to me that although I did mention via Twitter and via Discord that you will need to install tabulate and most people have gotten that others who have come in a little bit later this may be new to them and so i just wanted to point out that when we're in this lesson here i am using tabulate tabulate isn't 
already installed like some of this other stuff. Uh, you will have to go and install it the way that you install things in Python. He's using pip3. Here you can see uh, what I've done, sudo pip3 install tabulate. I also mentioned this on the wiki page uh, for uh, the, the GitHub for Quokka. And you can find all of the things that need to be installed. But be uh, happy and unconcerned because tabulate, I think, is about the only thing that you really need to install up until, certainly up until this point, And I believe up until we get down through a lot of the basic stuff. So just remember, you may need to do this if you haven't done it already. sudo pip3 install tabulate in order to make sure tabulate is installed because I do reference it in here. The alternative is you could say, well, I don't care about all of that fancy schmancy printing. And then you can just remove from the code the tabulate stuff and that will work as well. But if you want to use it and you want to do what I did, then please just do sudo pip3 install tabulate. That's it. Now back to the lesson. But there's another type, which you see quite often, where it says just import string. So it doesn't have from module import a specific item. It says import this entire module. So the difference, as you might expect, is in this, this situation, you are saying, I want to import everything from string. And so Python is going to go out and examine this string module and determine everything that's in it and make it all available to you. On the other hand, when you say from, let's use this one, from operator import item getter, what that is saying is Python will go out to the module called operator and it will look inside it to find something called item getter and it will make item getter available to you. Now you can see that this may be a little bit more efficient. You're getting only what you need in these situations. Uh, in this situation here with tabulate, it's similar to pretty print, pprint here, in which case the actual function that we are importing is going to have the same name as module. You see that quite often. But as you see in this example, where we imported from operator, we imported item getter, and from random, we imported choice, you can import just a single item from there and it doesn't have to be the same name. So that's a general idea of what's happening when we use these import statements. You may be looking at this and say, whoa, why are we importing so many things? I'll be showing you all the different capabilities that these bring to the table for us. Just we'll have a little bit of fun with that as we go on. Now let's talk about having multiple devices. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a handy piece of IDE functionality. I'm going to get rid of all of the code. You can probably barely see this. It's one of these plus signs. When I make it big, it turns into a minus sign. When it's expanded, there's a bunch of code there that I'm going to go over in a minute that is mainly generating random things for our devices so that we can create a certain number of them. But when I condense it, all it does is it just says the initial for statement, which makes it a little bit easier, especially for me to describe what is going on. So let me give you a high level view. I'm going to create something called devices and devices is going to be what type of data structure? It is going to be a list. And uh, so here is my definition of list. Another way I could create this would be by putting square brackets like that. This is an optional way of creating a list. Uh, for some reason, some of the IDEs and uh, Python prefers you to use the explicit way of doing it. So I'm going to go back to specifying it as so in this manner. So what's going to happen Right here, you can see in my comment, I'm going to create a large number of devices. And so that's what my for loop is going to do. Now, the data for the for loop is right here. This is my data for the for loop. We're going to go over that in a second, but I want to not focus on that for the moment. So let's assume that I've created a list called devices that has a bunch of devices in it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first print them out. And then I'm going to use a function to print it out in the form of a table. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what this looks like when I run it. So it's going to create my devices. If I go to the very top here, 
you can see that it's creating and it's actually printing out all of these devices. There's the first device, here's the second device, after that is the third device, etc. You can see I'm giving it an IP address. Uh, please ignore the fact that this is, an in, this is a subnet address, not an IP address. This is just make-believe for now. We're pretending to create these things. I'll show you how to create it without a zero uh, at the beginning. And if I scroll all the way down here to where these end, then you can see, okay, well, here's the last one I created, 91. That kind of makes sense when I look over here on the left. Even though you don't understand completely the syntax of Python and how it does this, you can say, oh, well, here's a 100. I kind of expected this for loop to execute 100 times. And if I started at zero, that would make sense that the very last one was 99. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to actually print out devices as list of dicks. So you can see I'm doing a pretty print here. And here's my pretty print. Now notice this square bracket right there, that's an indication that the data that's about to follow is a list. And the end of the list is way down here at the bottom. We'll eventually get there, trust me. Down here at the bottom, here's our closing bracket. So this is the very last item in this list. You can see it's actually doing it in, uh, I believe, the order. So the IP address is 99. It's uh, done it in the, in fact, this is an important thing for me to point out. I'm going to go back to the beginning of our list. What did we say about lists? My first question to you would be, lists are, are they sorted? And the answer to that is no, they are not naturally sorted. Are they ordered? In other words, once you put them in, do they retain that exact same order? And the answer to that is yes, they are ordered. If you want to sort them, you can use functions to sort them. In fact, if you like to look ahead while I'm speaking, you may see that I've done that exactly when we do this next tabulate thing. And I'll explain to you how that has been done and uh, what it looks like. But now here we have a list. What's the first item in the list? The first item is right here. It's in what type of character? It's inside curly brackets. That tells you it is a dictionary. So this is a list of dictionaries just as this little item that I printed out right there. And here's my cute little, uh, the keys for my device dictionary. So this is a list of devices. So now we've seen the list of devices and we're printing them out using pretty print. But we probably wouldn't be giving this to our boss. Uh, it takes up a lot of space. We might want to print out a nice table. How can you do that? Well, you could do it by hand using print functionality. Remember we talked about the F string. That would be a good way to do this. But it may comfort you to know, and this is one of the nice things about Python, is that so many functions and modules have been created for your benefit so that you can easily use this extra functionality to do things that are commonly done. So somebody, if I look over here, and don't look at the details of this code just yet, just look at this word. This is tabulate. Remember, we imported it. I'm saying I want you to print a table version, a tabulated version of this code that I'm going to give you. And the code will be a list of items. In our case, it's a list of dictionaries. And so what it has done is it has automatically, I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was feed this information into tabulate and it prints this out nicely. Now I'm gonna point out to you that I've done sorting a little bit different. If you remember, it was originally put into the list in the order where we were creating IP address 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 and then .1.2.3.4, but it's not printing it out in that order. That's because I've sorted it according to some other functionality. And what I've done, if you were to peek ahead here, is you would say, just looking at this, so you're sorting it. What am I sorting? I'm sorting the devices list. 
What am I sorting it based on? You will see this periodically in Python. This is how we sort lists of dictionaries. Now, it's not super clear cut, but I'm using this functionality called item getter. You don't have to worry about the meaning of that uh, or how this actually works. But if you look at it, you can say, oh, well, if I was just guessing, I would say first it's going to sort it based on vendor. And then within the vendor, it's going to sort it based on operating system. And then within operating system, it's going to separate it on the version that is in there. And remember, within our data, these are items within the dictionary. We have, uh, what did we do first? We did vendor, then we did OS, then we did version. And as I slowly scroll down here, you can see, oh, look, Arista is first. So I have Arista items in here. And I can see I only have one operating system for Arista, but it has managed to alphabetically sort these version numbers. If I go down to something a little bit more interesting, you can see Cisco. I have iOS and within iOS, I've sorted based on version. I have iOS XE and within iOS XE, I've sorted it based on the version. Now, one thing that we'll notice, and you'll have to deal with this as you build software, and that is that when you just do a regular alphanumeric sort, it is going to be different than the way that you and I might sort it. So 12 dot something followed by 20 dot something, that makes sense. But hold on there, why do I have eight dot something? Well, that's because in an alphanumeric search, one, then two, then eight. It's not aware of the different pieces of uh, the version. So don't worry about that. That's just how we're doing it. And this is what we're doing in order to simplify this. So let's go back and look at this code a little bit closer. We're gonna go into this last, but I have given you a little bit of an idea what tabulate did for us. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into this for loop. So remember, a lot of times in our for loops, we are iterating through things like lists. You can also iterate through lines of a text file. Uh, very simple and easy to do that. You can also iterate through dictionaries. I think we talked about that briefly last time. In this situation, it's a little bit different. I'm not iterating through something that exists. I'm iterating through a list of numbers. And so if you have done any programming before, like in a different earlier programming language like C or something like that, then you will remember something along the lines of four parentheses I equals zero, semicolon I plus plus, semicolon I is less than or equal to a hundred. This is basically performing that function for us. Now uh, we've seen that it creates from 0 to 100 in that situation. If I were to change this briefly, so now it's going from 1 to 100. What's going to end up happening when I run this is I'm going to let it run and I'm going to go to the very beginning where we start to print these things out. And you can see the very first one I created was 10.0.0.1, 10.0.0.2. .0 so uh, you can see I started at one this time. So now I ended up with only, I guess I have one. And then the last one is going to be, if you recall, 99. So I'm only going to have 99 of these things, which is okay. But that's just the way that this range thing works. But let's look in a little bit more detail about what a uh, range what this for loop is actually doing. Really, we kind of have the idea what the for loop is doing. Let's look at the details of what happens inside it. Now, what happens inside it is I'm creating an imaginary device using random functionality that exists in Python. This is not something that you will typically do unless you are trying to simulate devices in a network, which as it turns out, I am, and you'll see in Quokka, I will in the future be implementing some simulated devices. But let's look at what we're doing. First thing we do is we create the, the dictionary. The second thing that we're going to do is this. Now let's look at this really quick. What do you suppose this means? This says device. Device is what? Device is a dictionary. 
And now remember the subscript for my dictionary. If it's on the left-hand side of an equal sign, then I'm referencing a subscript within that dictionary. In this case, if it's a dictionary, then I'm specifying the key. Remember, dictionaries have keys and they have values. And so the thing on the left is the key. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and let this run because I think it might be of use to us. So let me go back up here uh, and where we start to print these things out and we'll just uh, be able to look at them. So here is my device. I'm saying I want to set the name to something. Now I could have set the name to like A1 through A99 or whatever. That would be fine. But I tried to give a little bit of realism. I'm using naming functionality, a naming pattern that we actually used at one of the places that I worked for about 25 years where we had the building and the pillar and then something else I can't remember. I have different recollections of that. So I'm basically using different things uh, that we had in our real life environment in order to create this. All I'm doing here is I'm creating a bunch of strings. You can see here R2. So my choice, as you can see, this is choosing one of these was R2. The second item was L. So you can see it chose either L or U. I think that stands for lower or upper. I was wrong about that. It stands for whether it was the first floor or the second floor. And then the last thing was actually just a letter. And in my world where I worked, that was actually the pillar number or something like that. And I end up with R2, LJ, R4, LF, R10, UQ, R3, UI, etc. You'll be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, could you have identical device names? And you're absolutely correct. I could do that. I'm just doing this for the purpose of simply showing something, a bunch of devices that have some semblance to realism. When we come down here, look at this and think to yourself, what am I doing with this statement? Just look at what I've highlighted. I'm going to be setting what key. The key is vendor. So this is the item that I'm going to be setting. And so device sub vendor or vice with a key value of vendor is going to be a choice of Cisco, Juniper or Arista. That's why you see Juniper here, Arista there. Cisco down there, etc. I'm just doing this choice thing. Where did choice come from? Remember, choice was something that we imported at the very beginning. Here I'm setting vendor. And now for every vendor, I'm going to go down and I'm going to set the operating system and the version. And I want to make sure that if it's Cisco, then the operating systems will be either iOS, iOS XE, iOS XR, or Nexus and the version, these are made made up versions. I know that these are not realistic, et cetera, but I'm just trying to generate some data for Juniper. I only have one OS and for Arista, I only have one OS too. And these numbers, I have no idea if there's any basis in reality there. So now I've done what? I've given my device a name. I've given it a vendor. I've given it an OS and a version. The last thing that exists is for me to give it an IP address. And in this example, I'm just simply giving it an IP address that's going to be equal to 10.0.0. The index. And then, as you, if you recall from up here, I did my nice printing and I do print this. And the last thing that we're going to do is I've created my device, but hold on here. The thing that I'm dealing with is this thing called devices. Remember devices? It's the list. So what I've created here is a device, a single device, which is a dictionary, and I'm putting it into this list called devices. And if you look here at my pretty print, remember the list is going to be all of these things, and each one of these is this individual device. The way that I add something to a list is I have two choices. One choice is I append it. As you might imagine, that puts it at the very end of the list. My other option is to insert it somewhere. And so if I wanted to put it into a particular order, I could insert it into the list. What we typically do is after we're all done, we can sort it based on different criteria. So I'm not worrying about that. 
So this is my this is my program. I'm going to do something here. I'm going to change this to just 10. And now let's run it and let's see what happens when I've changed it to 10. That's much easier to read. Maybe I should have done this from the very beginning. Here I have my 10 different devices. Here is my list of 10 devices where I'm doing the pretty print. And here are, you can see the last device that I created was 10.0.0.9 and the first one is dot one. Actually, I'm wrong when I said I'm creating 10 devices. How many am I creating? It's going from one up until less than 10. So I'm only creating nine of these. So if you were to do your quick math here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've created nine of these devices and then I've printed them out. Now, the last thing that I'll go over again really quick is I'm doing this tabulate. Oh, yes, I did want to pick this apart a little bit before we complete our time together. Now, you may look at this and say, wait on, you got like, look at all these parentheses. What are you doing to me? You're killing me. I can't even figure out what these are or what they're doing. Let's do something and make this a little bit easier. I could have done this in a different way. I'm going to print out a simpler way to do this without bundling everything together in that one line. So hang on a second. Okay, so what I've done here is I've made it a little bit simpler by first performing this functionality here. I'm sorting the list and assigning it to sorted devices. And then when I call tabulate, I'm actually going to just print out this thing that I just created, which is sorted devices. Now, if I've done that correctly, then what you'll see is that it's doing exactly what it did before. The only difference is it's a little bit easier for us to read. Now, what you will see quite often in Python code that you will inherit and you'll have to deal with is people will end up doing what I had done originally. Let me do control Z and just go back to the way that this was before. What people will tend to do is if it's a function that returns a value like this one did, then they just may put everything together here. The way that you make sense of this is you start from the left and you begin to parse it just like the computer would. Print, okay, here's a print statement. There's my begin and end. The next thing that's going to happen, what is it going to print? Oh, I'm calling a function called tabulate. That's going to return something that's printable. Okay, so tabulate. Here's my begin parentheses and there's my end parentheses. Now tabulate gets past, remember, a list of dictionaries. So what is the list of dictionaries? Well, hang on a second. We know that devices is a list of dictionaries, but before we got there, we're doing this thing called sorted. Now there's two different functions in Python, one called sorted, and sorted actually will sort the thing in place and return the actual new, it will actually sort the list and then it will return the value of the sorted list. And so sorted, so reading from left to right, I'm going to print, I'm going to tabulate something. Before I tabulate it, I'm going to sort this list. And the thing that I'm going to pass in, this is just part of sorting functionality, is I'm going to tell it how to do this. Now, this key equals item getter. This is one of the things about Python is it typically is very easy to read. For example, when you come up here, you get a very good idea that this for loop is going to go from 1 to 10. That's really nice. Things are generally very easy. There are some things that are a little bit more confusing. I specify the key here. If I have a list of dictionaries, then I need to do things like this. Just uh, it's a pattern that you get used to and just something that uh, just the way that Python actually works. And the end result, as we've seen, is actually quite nice. Here's a nice looking table. I really didn't have to do too much. The bulk of this code, as I mentioned, is right here in this funky functionality that created a bunch of devices when we go Later on in our discussions, I'm going to talk about functions and I'm actually going to put this functionality here that created the devices randomly 
into a separate function so that we don't have to look at it. So fairly simple, but we did go through lists. We went through, uh, sorry, we go through a for loop that's going through a range rather than going through a list or something different. And when we went through that, we just printed out all these dictionaries that we created. And then we did something fancy to create some nice looking output that maybe you could even feel comfortable giving to your boss or something like that. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, next, what we'll do is we'll go into a little bit of looking at what I've done with Quokka. Okay, friends, let's look a little bit more at Quokka and what I have implemented there. Uh, so let's, uh, there we're looking at the main screen that pops up, devices. I'll just show you uh, some of the information. You can see this device that in Sandbox, the CSR Sandbox device is giving us some pretty decent data. If I go back and I look at the, let me highlight something really quickly. This is the Nexus device, but I'm using the NX API in order to get information from it. So if I were to go back to where I was and look at devices, you can see I have NXOS Sandbox twice, but one of them I've actually given the name NX API. The other one I've given the name SSH. That's an indication of how I am accessing these and the actual OS that I'm storing to help me to be aware of this. This is helping me to deal with Napalm when I go access device, the device via that. I'm in one situation using NXOS and another situation using NXOS SSH. And so let's have a look at this one really quick, the NX API request. I actually thought that that would be going a little bit faster, but when you look at the response time, besides the fact that it's been unavailable quite often. If you look at the response time, that, my friends, is not milliseconds, that is actually seconds. So it takes, uh, in my experience, around 100 seconds to get a response back going through Napalm. Now, I've just started to do this this week. I'm not sure if there's something amiss with the way that I'm using Napalm or if it is just really, really slow to get information using that NX API from that device. But there you go, 100 seconds response time. That's not the best thing in the world. Although that's not just, that's I can't ping those devices, so my response time is for establishing connections. One thing that I wanted to point out here uh, that I did implement, I think I may have mentioned this last time. Uh, if you look here on the right-hand side where I have my hourly summaries, you see this dashed line, that's an indication of what the service level agreement is. Now I've just made this up, but I'm saying the service level agreement for getting access and a screen from HTBBC is one second. And so you can see most of the time it's better, but there's been times that it's worse. When I go down here to availability, I've set my availability service level agreement to 95%. And you can see with this particular one, the BBC News, that it's actually failing that quite often. Just so you know, if I go to a service such as DNS via Google and I look, here's my response time. I've set it at one second and you can see it's really, really, really low. My availability SLA is 95 and you can see it always meets that. But let's go and look really quickly at something that I did add, which is events. So I may have shown you this before. Most of my events were pretty boring in that it was only showing when I couldn't get to it. But I've added events that indicate SLA failures. And so here you can see my NXOS sandbox going via SSH response time violation. I had set, set the SLA for response time to be 15 seconds, but it actually came in at 18.62 one time. And that time you can see CSR was the same. Here's our friend HTTP BBC, and this is an availability violation. So it's availability over the course of the hour that I calculated it was only 93%, and I was expecting it to be 95%. So this is just some of the stuff that I've added, um, pretty simple to add. But let's look at this again and uh, remind ourselves 
what's actually going on. So you recall there are two services that are actually running. One application running is Flask and the other one is Node.js. Flask is serving up the actual data that I'm recording in the database from the devices and hosts and services. And Node.js is doing the framework of the screens into which I'm putting that data. Now, if we minimize this and we minimize this, you can see I actually, in my terminal windows, I've got two things going on here. One that's going on and you can see it's actually alive and doing stuff is this is my Flask application. I'm actually running Flask and doing some actual stuff with it. And down here is where I'm running Node.js. Uh, so here I did an NPM start it down here and that's serving up my web pages and the actual data. I started by doing a Flask run. So how do you even get started with that? <clears throat> you may be asking the question. Well, let's start with Flask. Getting Flask started is very simple. Here's the first Flask application that you could actually write today and have it work successfully. So let's look at the different lines. Remember, we talked a little bit about imports and I was importing these little trivial pieces of functionality. This is actually importing all of Flask. Remember, Flask is this big thing that's giving me a web service and allowing me to do web requests and, and have routes and do all kinds of interesting stuff. So that is actually the Flask piece. Whoops, let me go back to this. That is what I'm getting with Flask. And all you do is you say whatever you want to call it, your application, you're going to create this object. Now, let me tell you something really quick and just give you a little insight. In Python, functions as well as variables, and I haven't gone into this, maybe I should have, are all lowercase. And we use this item right here in order to separate the different components of a variable name or a function. In programming parlance, we call this snake case. We have snake case and we have camel case. Camel case capitalizes the first letter of every word. So if this was a, like flask class, if it was called that, then the F would be capitalized and the C would be capitalized. In our situation, there's only one word here, but the first letter is capitalized. That's an indication that it is an object and a class in this object-oriented world. But everything else in the world of Python is going to have this type of pattern for function names and variable names, which we call snake case. So this is the function right here. This is the object flask that we created. When we want to tell Flask what is the URL that is going to be used that will eventually call our function, we use a route. And so a route says this is what the URL is going to be. And when you see this, then you need to do something. And in our situation, all we're going to be doing is returning a string called hello world. You can try this and you will see that you can, you know, if you follow this, this is just the Flask documentation. And here Flask is describing all of this information. Uh, you can see that it's really fairly simple. Let's look at my code that I've used to create this. And we're looking here. This is for a more ambitious Flask application. There's, they have patterns for doing that as well. And I'm creating within this uh, actual module that I'm calling underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. Inside here, you'll see some things that should look familiar. Remember that? That's the same thing as what we saw here from Flask, import Flask. So that's consistent. Now, if I go down here, app equals Flask, underscore, underscore, name, that is actually the same thing that was done right here. Now, in this situation, in the same actual module, they defined their routes, but our application is a little bit bigger than that. And so what I did is I put my routes into my view module. And if I go and open up views, then you're going to see stuff. Oh, hey, look, it's app route. And here's the URL snippet. 
If somebody gives me service slash TS, that's what I'm going to be doing. If somebody gives me host TS, that's what I'm going to be doing. If I go to the very top where I have some of the more basic ones, here's where I get devices. So this is where that list of devices comes from. Um, if I go down further, here's where I get hosts. That's where that list of hosts comes from. Here's where I get events. That's where the list of events comes from. So I'm basically using Flask exactly as is defined in this simple uh, description, but I'm doing it as a more ambitious, a little bit more involved amount of code in order to implement it. So hopefully that gives you a general idea of what I'm doing with uh, Quokka. I've uh, recently implemented some netconf functionality, and so I'm planning uh, anyway on forking a new branch, creating a new branch, in my application and creating a version of Quokka that actually will do netconf to one of those devices. And hopefully I'll be able to show you that in the near future. But uh, if you recall, I am going to be talking about in the future when we get to networking, one of the things that I'm doing and that you can see me working on here is gonna be this netconf example. So I'm actually uh, getting netconf data from various devices. Anyway, that's about it for now. Hopefully that made some sense to you. Thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully it is making sense and you're getting just a little bit closer to becoming the programmer that you want to be. Thanks. <music>